Sarah Hammerschlag. I'm a professor of religion and literature, history of Judaism, um, and philosophy of religions at the Divinity School. And the text I'll be talking about today is Kafka's Before the Law. So you might be surprised to think about a figure like Franz Kafka in the context of religion. He was clearly not a figure who was inside any religious tradition. Most people associate him often, for example, with the adjective Kafkaesque that was coined in relationship to his work, and thus with a kind of alienated modernity. There's a certain version of 20th century bureaucracy that's become associated with the name Kafka. But at the same time, one has to note that there actually wasn't a time in Kafka's reception in which his work wasn't associated with religion. Max Broad, who was a good friend of his, was responsible for the dissemination of his work. And his interpretation, for example, of the castle immediately read the book as a, a religious allegory. Gershom Sholem, the great uh, scholar of Jewish mysticism, um, called Kafka a, a modern day Kabbalist. Uh, Walter Benjamin, his friend, Sholem's friend and interlocutor, described Kafka's work as about the sickness of tradition, um, about a religious world in which there was transmission, but no God. He's been described as a Gnostic, as a crypto-Christian, as an author of Jobian literature. Now, all that being said, that's actually not what interests me about teaching before the law for um, any course on religion, actually, because we can actually read before the law as a text about concepts that are really important to the study of religion, concepts such as truth, authority, and the nature of law and scripture and the relationship between those two. And that's, for me, what makes this text so important to the study of religion. So let me give you some context uh, for thinking about Kafka and for thinking about the composition of this particular text. So he was born July 3rd, 1883, and he died June 3rd, 1924. So he, was, he died just short of his 41st birthday of tuberculosis. He lived in Prague, which was itself multicultural in the sense that there was a majority of a Czech population and a dominant majority of Germans who were powerful in government. And there was a small minority of Jews, 6%. Kafka's family was very much of that small minority. But they were assimilated. And what's interesting about that is that's not so different from what it means to be an assimilated Jew in contemporary America. Um, it meant, for example, that his father belonged to a synagogue, that Kafka had a bar mitzvah, though his parents called it a confirmation, but that he felt deeply alienated from the tradition. There was a sense in which his father was still connected to the world of the ghetto. It wasn't that far back. But Kafka himself felt that he had been deprived of a certain Jewish authenticity. He famously said, most young Jews who want to write German wanted to leave Judaism behind them. And their fathers approved of this, but vaguely. This vagueness was what was outrageous to them. With their posterior legs, they were glued to their father's Jewishness. And with their waving anterior legs, they found no new ground. The ensuing despair became their inspiration. So in that sense, what Benjamin might say that his work is saturated with Jewishness, but it's also important to recognize that he was also three other things very clearly. He was a lawyer, and that is important to the text that we're reading today. He was a son, and he was a writer. As a lawyer, he went to law school, and he worked for the Workers' Accident Insurance Institute until forced by his, um, by his ailment, by the tuberculosis, to retire in 1922. He said about his own relationship to the law that it too infused all of his work. He wrote to one of his lovers this letter that famously he wrote called A Letter to My Father. It's an interesting letter because he, it's not clear that he intended actually to give it to his father. He sent it to his mother and he sent it to his girlfriend. Um, and his mother decided not to give it to his father, um, realizing that it would damage him. It's, it's a letter that's full of accusation. But when he sent it to his girlfriend, he said about it that she should read it as an avocat brief, as a lawyer's document, a lawyer's letter. So, and that indicates that the sort of way in which law functions for him is actually, it's, it's, it's intrinsic to the way in which he understood reality. He had a difficult, or thought of himself as having a difficult relationship to his family. He lived with his family, basically, until he went to a sanatorium and, and passed away there. And so there were few interruptions. But by and large, he was very much in this nuclear family context. And so that pervades his work. And so in that sense, people often think about him as a son, think about him as also 
inflected or deeply affected by the authority of patriarchy. Now, as a writer, people often think of Kafka as only sort of posthumously having been a writer, but that's actually not the case. He published two short story collections during his lifetime. And one of the things that's interesting about this text is that it's one of the few texts in Kafka's corpus that was actually published twice in his lifetime. But the reason people think that he really wasn't a writer by day or that he uh, labored in obscurity is, of course, that he continued to work until 1922 as a lawyer, but also because so much of his work was posthumously published. And there's been so much drama about that work. So Max Broad, his friend who I already mentioned, was his literary executor. And Kafka himself burned 90% of what he wrote by the time he died. And he told Broad in a letter, he, in, he instructed him to burn the rest after his death. But we owe Kafka's corpus, his three novels, The Castle, America, and The Trial, to the fact um, that Broad did not um, burn any of it. In fact, he in very quickly, a few years after, signed a contract to publish um, his collected works. So I'm going to talk now about the text itself, um, the themes that are uh, important to it, and the questions the text provokes. One of the features of this text is the fact that we know about it, that it was first composed as a part of the novel The Trial, um, which he was writing, I think, as early as 1912. Um, and what we know about it is that it's, it appears at the end of the novel. And so the novel, De Process, is about Joseph K. And Joseph K wakes up one morning to discover that he's been, quote unquote, falsely accused. At the end of the novel, he goes to a cathedral. And at that cathedral, he meets a priest. And the story that we are reading today appears in that context. So Kafka is actually saying to the priest that he is falsely accused. And the priest essentially says to him that he doesn't understand the nature of the court. And he tells this story, this we can understand it as a parable. In some sense, it clearly functions as a parable in this context, in order to explain what Kafka doesn't understand about the court. And then what follows is actually a kind of lengthy, almost, interpretation of the parable itself. Do we respect the fact that what Kafka published was only the parable and not the novel? So shouldn't we read the parable without reading what, it, what he says about the parable in the novel, or should we take that into account? I mean, and those kinds of questions about whether we respect author intentionality, how do we read a text, how do we know what the text means, those are beautifully dramatized by this little tiny story that we are going to discuss them as we read the text. Now, one thing that's interesting about it that you can't see when I'm just reading it is that, of course, in the German, the word law, Gesetz, is capitalized because nouns are capitalized in German. But it's also capitalized in the translation. And this is very interesting to me, because the question of whether or not it should be capitalized is itself a question. Why? Because the sense in which what's being talked about in this story somehow conceals secrets. That's what makes the story so powerful, that you can't read it without thinking that it conceals secrets. Now, what's interesting to me in teaching it is not that we're going to reveal those secrets. What's interesting to me is how you, as a reader, are provoked to interpret them the desire to understand the mysteries of the text. And this, I think, makes it super interesting for thinking about the way religious texts impact readers. What I would like to do now is actually read the story to you. Before the law stands a doorkeeper on guard. To this doorkeeper, there comes a man from the country who begs for admittance to the law. But the doorkeeper says that he cannot admit the man at the moment. The man, on reflection, asks if he will be allowed then to enter later. It is possible, answers the doorkeeper, but not at this moment. Since the door leading into the law stands open as usual and the doorkeeper steps to one side, the man bends down to peer through the entrance. When the doorkeeper sees that, he laughs and says, if you are so strongly tempted, try to get in without my permission. But note that I am powerful and I am only the lowest doorkeeper. From hall to hall, keepers stand at every door, one more powerful than the other. Even the third of these has an aspect that even I cannot bear to look at. These are difficulties which the man from the country has not expected to meet. The law, he thinks, should be accessible to every man and at all times. But when he looks more closely at the doorkeeper in his furred robe with his huge pointed nose and long, thin, tartar beard, 
he decides that he had better wait until he gets permission to enter. The doorkeeper gives him a stool and lets him sit down at the side of the door. There he sits waiting for days and years. He makes many attempts to be allowed in and wearies the doorkeeper with this importunity. The doorkeeper often engages him in brief conversation, asking him about his home and about other matters. But the questions are put quite impersonally, as great men put questions, and always conclude with the statement that the man cannot be allowed to enter yet. The man who has equipped himself with many things for this journey parts with all he has, however valuable, in the hope of bribing the doorkeeper. The doorkeeper accepts it all, saying, however, as he takes each gift, I take this only to keep you from feeling that you have left something undone. During all these years, the man watches the doorkeeper almost incessantly. He forgets about the other doorkeepers, and this one seems to him the only barrier between himself and the law. In the first years, he curses his evil fate aloud. Later, as he grows old, he only mutters to himself. He grows childish, and since in his prolonged watch, he has learned to know even the fleas and the doorkeeper's fur color, he begs the very fleas to help him and to persuade the doorkeeper to change his mind. Finally, his eyes grow dim, and he does not know whether the world is really darkening around him or whether his eyes are only deceiving him. But in the darkness, he can now perceive a radiance that streams immortally from the door of the law. Now this life is drawing to a close. Before he dies, all that he has experienced during the whole time of his sojourn condenses in his mind into one question, which he has never yet put to the doorkeeper. He beckons the doorkeeper, since he can no longer raise his stiffened body. The doorkeeper has to bend down to hear him, for the difference in size between them has increased very much to the man's disadvantage. What do you want to know now, asked the doorkeeper. You are insatiable. Everyone strives to attain the law, answers the man. How does it come about, then, that in all these years no one has come seeking admittance but me? The doorkeeper perceives that the man is at the end of his strength and that his hearing is failing, so he bellows in his ear. No one but you could gain admittance through this door, since this door was intended only for you. I am now going to shut it. So, let's talk about the text. The first thing I want to talk about in relationship to the text is actually what's not on the page. What's excluded? What we don't know. Let's just think of a few examples. We don't know what the law is. I mean, how could it mean, what would it mean to enter the law? Law isn't normally something one enters, right? It's something one obeys. So what does it mean to think of the law as something that one could enter? We don't know the nature or the source of the doorkeeper's authority. We don't know the nature, really, of their relationship. We don't know, is the doorkeeper good? Is there some, source of, some sense of that there is a friendship being described here? We don't know the nature of the radiance that the man from the country sees. What does it mean that the gate is just for him? How is it that it functions to close, not to open? Does this mean that the law is personal, or is it fundamentally impersonal? What's significant is that the story ends the moment the doorkeeper stops speaking. Why is this significant? I think because at that moment, you as reader realize that your desire to understand the text is completely aligned with the man from the country. You have a sense that his life ends as the door closes, and at that moment, the book shuts. At that moment, the story is over. And so your desire and his desire are at that moment perfectly aligned. What does that tell us about reading the text, these questions and that fact? There's an impulse immediately to answer all the questions. And what does it mean to answer all the questions? It means to find out what the text means. And there's this sense when you want to know what the text means that you want to uncover its truth. You want to know what, what the law really is, what the light is. When a faculty member here said, well, of course, the text is Torah. And I said, well, why do you assume the text is Torah? And she said, well, because law, Torah. And I said, but we, the word German is Gesetz. It just means law. The desire to close down some of the openings is our first instinct. And I see this with students all the time. They tell me the nature of the law. They tell me that, in fact, 
um, the man from the country could have entered the law if he'd really want to, but it's clear that he just didn't try hard enough. And what's fascinating to me about that is the way in which that desire to penetrate the text mirrors the man from the country's relationship to that sense of depth behind the doorkeeper. If the doorkeeper says, there are many doorkeepers behind him, one more powerful than the last, you have this sense of depth. And with that depth, you have the sense of authority. Now, the immediate assumption is, where does that authority come from? I hear this all the time. Well, it must be God. But of course, nothing in the text tells you it's God. So you have to fill that in. You have to read that into it. That's not on the page, right? But what's interesting is that we imagine that behind the text is a whole world, and that the text is simply representing it, and that what we need to do is fill out that world. But that's the same experience of the man from the country. But it is up to the reader, in some sense, to imagine that depth. And in imagining that depth, we tend to give that depth a site of authority and truth. We tend to assume that there's some hierarchy of meaning behind it. And that's what makes this text so interesting for thinking about the way in which scripture operates and for thinking about the way in which law operates, where the power of law comes from, how it is that we presuppose the authority behind the law, whether or not we actually know its source. So I said that I wanted to think about this text without the interpretation from the trial, but I do, in fact, want to bring in here just two sentences that come out of what the priest says when Kay is debating with him about the nature of the text. And so I'll just read those to you. It's not necessary to accept everything as true. One must only accept it as necessary. And then I'll read you the second one. The court wants nothing from you. It receives you when you come, and it dismisses you when you go. Now, to think about these two together in relationship to our story, I think, is quite interesting. For one, it's the assumption that we think necessity and truth are aligned. The idea that there could be necessity without truth is one of the things that I think this text explores, that Kafka himself explores. Something could be in force without truth being behind it. One of the things I think this text asks us to think about is where we presuppose truth when what's actually only in force is power. But I think our second quote from the priest, that the court wants nothing from you, it receives you when you come and dismisses you when you go, also helps us think about the relationship between truth and power. Because if you think about what's happening in the story, I think it's easy to assume that the one subjected in this relationship is the man from the country. That he has been subjected to the law by virtue of the fact that he spends his whole life in front of it, wanting access and then being denied. And one of the things that the priest does say is that, in fact, the man from the country has freedom. He could leave, whereas the doorkeeper has a post to keep. So the question is, who is actually in charge? And yet it's clear, in some sense, that the man from the country feels subjected to the authority of the doorkeeper. And the question is, how and why is that the case? So when the, the priest says, the court receives you when you come and dismisses you when you go, there's a suggestion, I think, that our relationship, I will say, to both law and to text, is that the attraction between them is often experienced as though the text or the law has a command over us, but that, in fact, we can, we can destabilize that by thinking about why it is that that's the case. And so there is, again, a moment in the trial that asks us to think about this. Because Kay does, in fact, leave the church where he's speaking to the priest. But before he goes, he says to the priest, is there anything more that you want from me? And the priest says, no, you can go. And Kay immediately gets upset, and he says, well, you were being so nice to me, and now, now you just want me to go? Well, but why do you want me to go? And there's this moment where in which that allows us to recognize that perhaps the experience in the story of the man from the country, the subjection and the attraction is actually driven by the man himself. I want to talk about some of the ways in which this text has actually been important and significant in a contemporary context. There are so many sources that one could look at, but I'm just going to focus actually on two. I'm going to focus on its interpretation by Jacques Derrida, the French philosopher, and by Judith Butler. 
um, the American philosopher and gender theorist. It's Derrida's reading that actually inflects Butler, so let's, let's talk about that first. So if we were to answer the question, how is this text important for the contemporary context, Derrida would have, I think, on one level, a simple answer. And that answer would be something like, well, it tells us about the nature of literature. But he also says it tells us about the nature of law and a particular feature of law, the sense in which law is both universal and singular. Now, what do I mean by that? We encounter this in the story itself, that the man from the country says, the law should be accessible to everyone. But then we discover in the story that the gate is only for the man from the country. That combination of things, the idea that the law should be accessible to everyone and the gate is only for the man from the country, Derrida reads that as actually describing the way in which we understand the law to speak and to legislate in universals, but insofar as it's applied, and insofar, in fact, it applies to me, insofar as I am subjected to it, I always experience it as profoundly personal. Now, you can think about that in the sense that when one is punished for breaking the law, or when one is constricted in one's behavior because of the law, one experiences that in one's body, in one's feeling, that is deeply singular. You can think about it in the fact that every time a law has to be applied, it has to be applied to a very specific historical situation, to an event that only happens once, and therefore the generality has to become a singularity. So that there's a sort of, for, for Derrida, there's a fundamental paradox at the center of the nature of law in that it is both the source and the idea of, the, of being able to create a statement that is universally applicable and that it is a space in which we experience our singularity and our subjection so deeply personally. But then even further, there's a sense in which we are, this is where, where Butler comes in, there's a sense in which we experience ourselves as formed by the law, as, as, as becoming subjects in relationship to the law. In, Butler's text, Gender Trouble, it's famously about the idea of thinking about performance and drag as a way of destabilizing the, the way in which the gender binary, male and female, have be, we understand them to be naturalized. We, we have treated them as biologically um, encoded rather than as culturally created. And she wants to understand how it is that we seem to want to understand it as naturalized. So I want to read to you the way in which she understands Kafka's text as helping us think about that dynamic. So she writes, there's the one who waits for the law, sits before the door of the law, attributes a certain force to the law for which one waits. The anticipation of an authoritative disclosure of meaning is the meaning by which that authority is attributed and installed. The anticipation conjures its object. I wonder whether we do not labor under a similar expectation concerning gender, that it operates as an interior essence that might be disclosed, an expectation that ends up producing the very phenomenon that it anticipates. So as I understand that, she's suggesting that the power of the law comes from our expectation that if we fulfill it, it will deliver to us the truth of its naturality, right? And you can think about this in the way in which the performance of femininity for a woman is rewarded by the experience that perhaps her femininity is then revealed or empowered by that performance. And in so doing, one actually gives power to this gender binary and its naturalism actually becomes more and more powerful rather than less powerful. And so she thinks about this the relationship that we see between the man from the country and the doorkeeper, the way in which the man himself is the one who seems to imbue the relationship with power as a way of, as it's demonstrating what it would mean or showing us how we could begin to break apart um, that relationship between nature and culture. So as a scholar of religion and literature, let me say what I find really compelling about this text. I mean, it's everything that I've, that I've already said in, in reading it, but, but it's particularly about the relationship that I think we can find between religion and literature in the text. It's not a scripture, right? And in that sense, when we read it, 
We know that the activity of imbuing what's really going on, we know that that's a product of a fiction. And what's fascinating for me about the experience of a text that elicits that response so powerfully is the way in which it can demonstrate for us the ways in which we read texts that are imbued with the power of truth. When we read literature, we can see the way this functions. When we read scripture, we can also understand the way it functions in literature. We have developed an idea of literary canon in which we tend to imbue the idea of author intentionality or of meaning with almost as much power as we understand the mysteries of the Trinity. But the point is that we actually, the power relations, they get replicated in literature, but because when we're look, looking at fiction, we have the capacity to say to ourselves, there's nobody behind here. There's only text. And of course, we've all learned that about the death of the author, we all have an idea that the author's intention can, in fact, be taken out of our reading experience. So we have been trained on one level to question our desire for that kind of truth. Whereas in religious texts, whatever the form that truth maintains, we not only experience ourselves as subjected to the power of the text, we also feel the lure of being inside it, inside of the community of insiders that it creates. I use that language deliberately because of the image of the man from the country who wants so much to gain entrance to the law. That scripture, when it's understood as being proper to a tradition for which truth is at its core, absolute truth, divine truth, the promise of being on the inside of that truth is such an enormous power. And I think one of the things this text suggests is that it's the very nature of textuality that actually helps form that power. One of the images I think that really well demonstrates this is something that Walter Benjamin said about this parable. Now, first of all, he said about it that to read the parable, one realizes that the whole book, The Trial, is actually just an unfolding of the parable. But he also talks about the ways in which parables work in Kafka's work in ways that are quite interesting. He says, there are two kinds of parables. One kind of parable is folded up like a boat made out of newspaper. You can unfold it and lay it flat. And the pleasure of the text comes from laying it flat and seeing what it really means. There's another kind of parable that unfolds not like the newspaper boat, but like a blossom. In that sense, the petals just open. And he says all of Kafka's parables open like that kind of parable. And there is no doctrine beneath them. There's only the attraction to the flower itself. I think that really nicely describes the dynamic in Kafka's text, but I also think that it leads us to understand the nature of what it means to be captivated by a text that has mystery at its heart and that promises truth. Those two things, mystery, which means often that there are just things left out of the text, right? And also the promise of truth. That the lure of the text is actually never going to be dissolved by truth. In fact, what's only going to happen is that the, the desire to grow closer and closer to the flower is going to create its own power. Now, I say, I, I refer to this as a kind of subjection, and I guess you know, I want to conclude by saying that I don't think of subjection as necessarily or only a problematic thing. Butler, in thinking about this uh, dynamic in relationship to gender, very much wants to create some a kind of emancipatory possibility. But I also think that it helps us to understand how powerful text is, how powerful stories are, that the idea that there's a secret behind them is what makes us keep reading. And we want that. And we are formed as human beings by that desire and by the way the texts inform us. To conclude, um, I would just say this is the promise of the study of religion. There is something so important about understanding that as human beings, we do demand a kind of subjection. We do demand the desire to be in thrall. And if there's one thing that I think um, all of Kafka's work, one of the reasons I think its impact has been so powerful is that it creates over and over again by means of its mystery, by means of its enigmatic nature, that sense of being in thrall. Of course, there are many ways to read 
this text before the law, I'm only offering one of them, and there's been many interpretations, and there's many other sources to read if this is something that interests you. So obviously the first place to begin would be to read not only the text itself, but Kafka's novel, The Trial. Um, and then the next place I would go is Walter Benjamin's essay, Franz Kafka, and then the following essay, Some Reflections on Kafka, the both of which are included in his volume, Illuminations. Um, Derrida's essay, which is collected in Acts of Literature, which has the same name before the law, which I think is, is intentional, um, is another really important source. Of course, um, Judith Butler's Gender Trouble, which I discussed. Um, and there are other important places as well, which I wasn't able to talk about. Deleuze and Guattari's um, Kafka Towards a Minor Literature. And then a really lovely little book that both, in, it has both biographical information as well as a really interesting reading about the function of shame and guilt in Kafka is Saul Friedlander's. Um, book, um, Franz Kafka, The Poet of Shame and Guilt, which I think was um, published as a part of the Yale's Jewish Lives series. Every time I reread Before the Law, which is many times now, I find myself with more questions and I find myself um, inclined to come up with more answers and having to resist that. Um, so I wish for you only that you reread the text as many times as I have and that you experience the wonderful experience both of having the questions and recognizing that the questions themselves are part of what makes this text so powerful. Mm -hmm.